Hello everyone, this is Nitpicky Nerd and this is my review of episode 10 of season 4 of Star Trek Lower Decks called Old Friends New Planets and I was mostly disappointed by this episode even though it did have a few jokes I liked and uh, visually it was good and had a lot of references to many Star Trek movies especially Star Trek 2, The Wrath of Khan and so I cannot say I hate this episode, but I was uh, mainly disappointed by the story and the many things that don't really make much sense. And I know it's a comedy show, but still for the most part, most of the time it was semi-plausible and it was clever and the references and continuity was always correct. And for the first time, I feel as if they're uh, dropping the ball on that. And the many missed opportunities really disappointed me. And uh, I made a video about my theories that maybe they'll explain that Nick Locarno was always a transporter clone of Tom Paris or his counterpart from the Mirror Universe, uh, which Starfleet classified and so he changed his name. Something like that could have been interesting and instead they just uh, treated him as a totally separate character. There was only one line by Rappaford who said that he kind of looks like Tom Paris. And then Boimer said that he doesn't see it and that was it. That was the only reference to the fact that Nick Locarno and Tom Paris are really similar. And so that was my first disappointment. And at least they didn't do anything that contradicts my theories and so it's still possible. So I'm going to put that video of mine in my playlist of Star Trek theories. And in my head canon he will always be a transporter clone of Tom Paris who got classified by Starfleet. Maybe he got into an argument with his father Admiral Paris and so he disowned him and so he changed his name. And it was part of the reason he turned evil and all of that. And uh, speaking of being evil, that's another problem, because in that TNG episode, The First Duty, Locarno was never really evil. He was obviously a little bit of an a-hole, but he didn't intend to kill anyone, he didn't want to harm anyone, he just tried to protect his team and all of that, and in the end of that episode they even said that he tried to take all the blame only on himself to protect his team members, so that they can uh, stay in Starfleet and all of that. So... He was never really evil, and if he would have become Tom Paris in Voyager, which was the original intention, he could have been kind of redeemed. Like, they can always reference to the fact that he made some bad decisions in his early life and all of that, but he would still be an overall good character. The only reason they didn't do it and change his name is not to pay the original writer of that episode any royalties for using that character, and so that's the only reason they changed his name and changed his backstory a little bit, as if he joined the Maquis and then was in jail for that and then was given another chance by Janeway, and so it could have been the same character and it would have been mostly the same. And in this episode they kind of turned him into an evil supervillain, so that's another problem. And also they never explained how he got all this advanced technology, because not only he designed and built this super ship by himself, a ship which can overpower any other ship in the galaxy, as we've seen across this whole season, and I made theories that maybe it's someone from the future, maybe it will be future guy from Enterprise, something like that could have also been much better than what we got. But what we got doesn't make any sense because they never even explained why he has the technology to build super ships more powerful than any other ships. And also in this episode, they revealed that he has the technology to create some kind of force field around an entire solar system and no one can pass that force field. That's almost like a Q-level ability. And they never explained how he got all this technology. They implied uh, that the shield is from the binars because it's called a Trinar shield, something similar to the Binaries, and yet it was never really stated in the dialogue. And even for the Binaries, it's too powerful, and so they never explained any of these uh, things. How did he build his super ship? He also has his own uh, space station that can repair and build ships, and uh, I thought they were going to somehow explain it when Mariner was on board, and they were walking in the corridors, and she was talking about how white everything is on the inside. And when I saw that, I was reminded of that automatic repair station that we saw in season 2 of Enterprise, the one that Enterprise docked with and it uh, was ruled by AI and it was much more advanced than any Starfleet technology, even by 24th century standards I would say. And in the end they discovered that uh, station wants to kidnap people to use their brains as part of its AI system or something and so in the end they destroyed that station but uh, we were shown that it is repairing itself in a kind of scary cliffhanger kind of ending and we never heard about it since and so they could have said that Tom Paris, eh, sorry, Nick Locarno found the remains of the station somewhere and then used it to build his new ship which is much more advanced and all of that so they could have somehow made some kind of an excuse for how he got this amazing technology and resources to build all of this and yet they never explained it. 
and also they never explained how he was able to convince the crew members of all those ships he attacked. He somehow, they now say, he simply convinced the, all the lower decks of those ships to rebel against their commanders and join him and his coalition of equals, as he says, and yet he's their leader somehow. And uh, the ones we saw on the planet in the previous episode, those were all the commanders of all those ships whose lower decks rebelled against them to join with Locarno and left all their commanding officers on that planet we saw in the previous episode. And, you know, before each of those attacks by that super ship against all these alien ships, we did see some scene of lower decks complaining about their commanders and all of that. And it was kind of funny because the whole show is called Lower Decks. And so it's nice to see the lower decks of other alien ships. And yet it's still hard to believe they would betray not just their captains, they would betray their uh, own organizations, their own empires and all of that. So they now decide to defect from their own people, not to see their planets and families ever again and go with Locarno. How? How did he convince them not only to betray their captains, but also to basically defect and leave their own planets and go with this coalition of other aliens who they don't even like and so it's just too hard to believe and just him being so charismatic and a natural born leader it's not enough to convince me that uh, all these different aliens chose to abandon everything just to follow him it doesn't make sense especially when he just attacked them they didn't show how exactly it happened how did he convince them and they could have easily explained it by showing that maybe he found some device somewhere that can telepathically influence people to make them more susceptible. Something like that could have explained this. And also there was no real payoff to Mariner knowing Locarno from the Academy days because they said in the previous episode that she knew the Nova team. So she met Wesley Crusher, she met Locarno, she met Sito. And the episode actually starts with a flashback scene of that when they were all in the Academy together and then she met up with them. And we had voice cameos by Will Wheaton playing Wesley. And they even brought back the actress who played Sito, who's not even an actress anymore. She was only an actress for like two years. And they specifically brought her back to do her voice in this episode. And she only gets like one or two lines. So it seems like a huge wasted opportunity if you're going to bring her back. Why not do something more with that? You know, they could have said that uh, Locarno found out that Sito is still alive and held in the Cardassian prison. And so his whole mission is about saving her and that's why he's doing all of this. And that would have made him less evil, of course. Maybe he's doing it against the wishes of Starfleet or whatever, but he's doing something which he thinks is right to save his own team member. And he's going to do everything it takes to achieve that, even necessary evil. And then they could have saved her from prison, revealed that she didn't actually die in the end of that episode. And maybe they could have also found Thomas Riker in the same prison. They could have done some really epic stuff and tied up loose ends from the other shows, and yet they didn't. Instead, they brought back this actress after 20 years of her not acting, just to do like one or two lines for a flashback scene set in the Academy, which is not even necessary for this episode. They could have skipped this scene, it wouldn't have changed anything. And so to me, it seems like a huge missed opportunity. So anyway, Locarno shows Mariner around his space station, and again, the episode never explains how he got all these resources, not to mention the advanced technology. And he's like a super villain now transmitting messages to the whole quadrant and taking over a whole star system and setting up a shield that no one can penetrate around the entire solar system, which is something we never saw before. The only time we saw something like that was when the Q created a huge force field that can stop any ship from passing to new areas of the galaxy, something like that. So this was almost a Q level power and they never explained how he got all of this. And also he has a new Genesis device, which uh, the Ferengi lower decks had. And he just automatically assumes that Mariner will agree to cooperate with him and be on his side without any logical explanation. And what they should have done is say that he has some kind of piece of technology that can telepathically influence people to do his bidding and he uses it on Mariner and thinks it works on her. And later on they will reveal that actually she was faking it and somehow was able to resist it. And so he makes a speech to the whole quadrant and then tells Mariner to say a few words and then she pretends to be on his side and then suddenly tells everyone that he's an idiot and his plan sucks and then uh, steals the Genesis device and runs away from him. So that part was kind of funny, but again, it makes no sense because uh, why is he such an idiot? And if he is an idiot, how he got all this amazing technology and how he got all these other aliens to follow him. 
and she then steals a Starfleet ship which she had inside that starbase because she knows the passwords of her uh, mother who is a captain and somehow that allows her to take over that ship and uh, she escapes with the Genesis device. And I did like how she puts it in a seat belt in a chair next to her. First of all, it's nice to have seat belts finally. And also she kind of keeps talking with it as if it's her friend and she calls it GD in short because it's a Genesis device and so she keeps calling it GD and talks with it as if it's her friend. So that part was kind of funny. And then there's a bunch of chase scenes by all these coalition ships to try to catch her. And then there's a chase scene through an asteroid field and the rings of a planet and all that kind of stuff which is similar to many scenes in Star Wars and also in recent Star Trek. We had a bunch of scenes like that recently. And meanwhile uh, Mariner's mother is trying to find ways to penetrate that giant shield which is protecting that entire solar system. And so she goes to Orion to ask help from the Orions because Starfleet doesn't want to help them. And that's another thing that is uh, kind of a parody of the many times that uh, Starfleet admirals give our heroes orders not to do anything. And then the heroes have to disobey the order to save their friends. And then in the end of the episode, the admiral doesn't do anything about it. He just forgives uh, the captain for violating the orders and that's something that we saw so many times it's now kind of laughable. And it was good back in the day in the old Star Trek shows whenever the heroes would do the right thing despite orders it made them more heroic, you know, they risked their careers, it makes it all much more dramatic and tenseful. But it became like a joke because so many times we saw that and always there was no real punishment afterwards. And so now it's kind of a joke but I guess it fits in this show which is a parody. So I'm okay with it here but I really hope we won't see it again in the real Star Trek shows that much unless there's a really good reason for it. And you know recently we saw that in Star Trek Strange New Worlds when Spock disobeyed the orders of the Admiral and then also didn't get any punishment. And so they even do it in serious Star Trek shows and I wish they would kind of rein it in. There is no point to keep doing it all the time, it loses its value, it should be kept for really rare occasions. Because if they show it all the time as if it's always the case that it makes all of Starfleet kind of laughable. All the Starfleet admirals always give orders not to do anything and you have to violate them and then you get away scot-free with no punishment. So it becomes more and more ridiculous the more they do it. And so because Starfleet wouldn't help them they go to Orion to ask help from the Orions to get a warship from them. And Orion is now ruled by Tendi's sister that we saw earlier and they make a deal with her that if their champion defeats her champion then they'll get the warship and if not then the Orions will get the Cerritos. And it's time to pick the champion and uh, the obvious choice would be Shax but instead Tendi picks that uh, chicken psychiatrist guy and then he gets uh, thrown around by that huge uh, Orion lady. And Tendi calls to him to use his feathers against her because she knows that she has allergies and so it kind of works but then she faints on him and she still wins and so the Orions win that match. And Tendi's sister wants the Cerritos but then Tendi tells her I'll give you something more valuable, I'll give you myself because she always wanted her back at her side and so she's willing to sacrifice her Starfleet career if they'll help them and the Orions do give them a huge spaceship but it turns out that the ship is not working. And Rappaport gets into a fight with another engineer and then they settle it once again in the holodeck plane as Mark Twain. And that's a joke which we saw in a previous episode which I honestly just didn't get. I'm not sure why it's supposed to be funny and they do the same joke again. Meanwhile we see Mariner is still running away from all the many ships of that coalition of equals and she tries to convince them not to follow Locarno. And yet they don't want to listen and I really like the design of that Romulan ship which looks like a warbird but sideways and I think that was the original design of the TNG Romulan ship which they changed in the last second and you know what would have been even cooler if the middle part was like uh, rotating inside the bigger part if uh, it could change the position of those engines and do like a spin movement that could have been cooler you know spinning is a lot cooler than not spinning so that could have been even better maybe in the future we'll see something like that. And Mariner wants to set off the Genesis device on some uninhabited planet so that no one can use it. But those other ships block her and so eventually she goes hiding inside the nebula and then Locarno chases her inside there. And we have many shots which look exactly like in that nebula in Wrath of Khan. And visually it's all good. Visually I was enjoying it but again the story is not really that good. Locarno is just an evil maniac for no reason. And eventually all his uh, alien followers start abandoning him and then he's all alone against Mariner. 
Then the Cerritos shows up with Boimler in command and they're towing that giant Orion ship behind them with a the tractor beam and then throw that ship into that giant force field in space which creates a small hole in it and then the captain uses the captain's yacht which we finally get to see someone use to get through that small hole into that solar system. And Mariner activates the Genesis device inside the nebula and it has the Ferengi controls because the Ferengi owned it I guess they modified it. And Locarno beams to her ship and they fight it out, she tries to convince him to come back to the good side and it doesn't work, he tries to kill her. And then she's beamed out in the last second by her mother and Locarno is stranded alone on that ship with the Genesis device and tries to disarm it. And for a moment it seems it's working but then the Ferengi controls demand that he inputs a few bars of latinum to complete the disarmament which he doesn't have with him and uh, then it all blows up and... We see the whole nebula is affected by the Genesis device and it looks exactly like in Star Trek 2. And the Admiral says because you opened up relationships with the Orions that's why we're not punishing you for violating direct orders. And Talene also decides to stay on the Cerritos even though her old commanding officer tries to call her uh, presumably to allow her to come back to the Vulcans but she refuses and instead Tandy has to leave the Cerritos because she made that deal with her sister to go back to Orion and the last scene of her kind of saying goodbye to the Cerritos. So that's the only kind of cliffhanger of this episode. And you know what? I think uh, we should have some time off from Tendi. It would be nice to allow Talene to become the science member of the team for a while and Tendi can show up later. I wouldn't want them to undo it in just one episode later. And so I wish uh, she will be gone for a few episodes at least in the next season. Especially because I really like Talene. I think she should be a more prominent member of the team. So this is a good opportunity for that. And I never like how they undo all kinds of cliffhangers in just one episode. They set up some kind of big change and then they undo it in the very next episode. So it should at least last for a few episodes and not right away coming back to normal. So that's my hopes for the next season. So overall this episode was really disappointing in a lot of ways which I talked about. But it also did have a lot of neat visuals and action scenes and a lot of uh, nice references and parodies of the old movies and so I cannot say I hate it even though I do think it's probably the weakest season final and uh, maybe even one of the lesser episodes of the whole show because of the many missed opportunities and disappointments and unexplained things the way that the bad guy just magically has all this advanced technology with no explanation whatsoever really annoyed me. So that's my opinion, let me know what you think and we can discuss all of it in the comments below and I will see you all next time. Bye bye.